Naked Scientist. Time for the Naked Scientist with Dr. Chris Smith. Get all of your science-related questions through to us. Uh, 011-883-0702 in the WhatsApp line 072-702-1702. Dr. Chris Smith, happy Monday. I've been dying to ask you this question. Well, I thought you were going to ask me, first of all, what is load limiting? Um, no, and I no, can because put you we, out of your misery. No, I can because put you out we of your have misery to tune because... in. We have to tune in to Ray White <laughs> after five o'clock. No. Because this really matters, um, because we've got the same thing going on in many, many countries where the whole point of this is that there are various devices which don't need to be on all the time and which could manage if you turn them off for a while. And by equipping households with smart metering and smart control devices, energy providers are now in a position to be able to control what gets drawn from the grid when so that you can dynamically control things mm. so that you can limit the demand and in this way instead of the the grid being under huge surge all of a sudden and then nothing and it goes in a kind of boom and bust cycle mm. rather like the economy of uh, the UK at the moment yes. um, what you end up with is a much more stable system which is much more predictable and if it's more predictable it's easier to serve and you get more bang for your buck for everybody and so yes. it's actually much better but it does require quite a lot of investment up front in order to get the system to be dynamic <laughs> demand or load limiting ready. And not every grid is going to be able to do that. Yes, I got you completely. And thank you for sharing that. The question that I wanted to ask regarding the submarine um, that went down, I wanted to know, because people were trying to explain an implosion. I want to know the difference between an implosion and an explosion. I saw people using little examples where they'd put an empty can cold drink can over a flame and then immediately put it over I think freezing cold water and it would sort of but a lot of people obviously were busy asking what would have happened to these individuals my understanding is it happened so quickly that it's almost like you're turned to dust before you even know you've been turned to dust is there a way you can explain it without it getting too gruesome well, when we have any kind of explosion or implosion, at the root of that is a difference in pressure. Mm. Whether you have something which is not taking up much space and has a much higher pressure than the things around it, or the things around the thing have a much higher pressure than the thing inside. Either way, there is a pressure difference. When there's a pressure difference, there has to be a force being applied. So if you have an object, and you use the tin can as an example, if you have very high pressure inside a tin can, there's a force on the tin can to hold in that pressure. Mm. And if the tin can cannot retain that pressure because it fails in some way, mm -hmm. then it breaks apart and allows the pressure to equalize the difference between the inside and the outside. Mm. If you reverse that equation, like a submarine, as it descends down underwater, for every 10 meters it goes underwater, it's as though there's a no, another whole atmosphere of mm. the Earth's air on top of you. So by the time you're four kilometers down on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean where the wreck of the Titanic is, mm. which is four kilometers deep, that's 400 atmospheres of pressure. And at the surface, each square meter of your body has pressing on it about 10 tons of pressure. That's one atmosphere. So down at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, where the Titanic is, you've got the equivalent of about 4,000 tons standing on every square meter of something. So there's a huge pressure difference between mm. the inside of a submarine where it's at atmospheric pressure because you want the people to breathe as though they're at the surface yes. and the outside which is a really high pressure and therefore there is a huge force being exerted on the submarine if something fails and in this case they had a titanium structure supporting a, a carbon fiber in a vessel mm. and the two were coupled together mechanically to spread the load if it fails which we believe it did then it can no longer withstand that force rather like a bridge with too many cars on it and it suddenly catastrophically fails and you've got every square meter with a force of 400 tons on it pushing yes. inwards because there's very little inside and lots of pressure on the outside so it does the reverse of an explosion you're moving from an area of high pressure where the water is to low pressure on the inside <laughs> yes. and it instantly collapses down and it will do it in such a short space of time that anybody who was subject to that wouldn't know what was happening to them 
Wow. Okay. I think you've explained it quite well. We're going to take a quick break. I see your calls, Teppi, Glenn, Sandra. We'll take all of your questions for Dr. Chris Smith. 702. The Naked Scientist. 12 minutes to 3 o'clock. We're with Dr. Chris Smith taking all of your science-related questions. 011-883-0702 in the WhatsApp line. 072-702-1702. So now we go to the lines. Uh, We have... Ruwaida. I have to just get help with pronouncing that. Is it Ruwaida? Ruwaida. Yeah. Ruwaida. Ruwaida. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Dr. Chris Smith is listening. Um, hi, Dr. Chris. Um, I want to know, um, we always hear about high cholesterol being bad for a person, especially the heart. I read an article two days ago. A doctor from the UK actually saying that high cholesterol, <clears throat> depending how high, can actually be good for the body. It fights off certain illnesses. The only time it's bad, really, one of the points is when it crystallizes in the arteries. It prevents the normal flow of the blood through the vessels. So is it good or is it bad? Mm. Hi, Rueda. The answer is it can be both. And this is the confusing thing because cholesterol isn't one thing. Cholesterol comes in different forms in the body. And it tends to be considered, most simply, in two forms, a low-density form and a high-density form, which are called LDL and HDL, respectively. And when we measure the total cholesterol in the bloodstream, we can find it's high, but you find that person might have a very low risk of heart disease when you look. And the reason is that they've got lots of HDL and very low levels of LDL. So in other words, the bad guy of the cholesterol world is the low density or LDL form and the good guy is the HDL form. And it's not so much what your total cholesterol is, it's the ratio between those two. So if you have really high levels of HDL, you are much better off than someone who has relatively high levels of LDL. That's not to say that if you eat a poor diet and you elevate your cholesterol level with lots of saturated fat in your diet, you will be at higher risk of having a heart problem. But people who have, by and large, got a higher level of HDL will be better off than people who have a lower level of HDL. And you're right that the damage done by cholesterol is that as it goes around in your bloodstream, in some places the walls of arteries become transiently damaged and they become a bit porous and the cholesterol can diffuse or move from the blood into the damaged area and because of the inflammatory conditions in those damaged areas the cholesterol can become oxidized and it gets picked up by white blood cells that are called macrophages that happen to be there trying to clean up the debris and they become congested with all of this stuff which then forms a bulge in the wall of the artery and you have uh, an atheromatous plaque. And this takes up space, narrows the artery and therefore restricts the rate at which blood can flow through that patch of the artery. And that limits the flow of blood to things downstream, but it can also occasionally burst. And when it does burst or rupture, you can then form a big blood thrombus or clot on top of it, which can either break away and block the artery downstream or block the artery in that position and thus starve anything downstream of access to oxygen and nutrients, which is what happens if you have a stroke or a heart attack. So preventing that from happening is the goal of preventing arterial disease. And the best way to do that is to not smoke because smoking is the worst risk factor for that happening. And secondly, is to try to eat an artery friendly diet, which means not eating large amounts of saturated fat, getting your blood cholesterol tested. And if you do have a relatively high level of LDL cholesterol, considering in conversation with your doctor, the best way to manage that, which might include taking a drug called a statin, which can push the levels down a bit. Thank you so much for that question. Let's go through to Tepi in Northcliffe. Hi, Tepi. Hi, hello, hello, how are you? Good, thanks, and you? I'm good, thanks. Mm. 
Yes, um, I called last time asking about uh, my son not talking and all that. So mm. we went to the audiologist mm. and they confirmed that he has a hearing loss. Mm. So to my surprise, on Saturday, we were just playing music at home and he started dancing. So yesterday he started saying, Mama, even this morning. So I just don't understand. He's two years old. So I just don't understand. Is it a hearing loss or what's happening? Or he's just delayed in speaking i don't know oh that's an interesting one yes and and i'm also really glad that you uh, a shared your situation because many other people will probably be in the same situation as this and it would have been very helpful to them and i'm also glad that you were able to get an assessment and it turned out that there may be some degree of hearing loss um do remember though that hearing loss isn't a total absence of the ability to hear when people have hearing loss it can be selective for certain frequencies which means that certain things are less discernible especially speech if you if you don't have good hearing for the range of sounds that involve are involved in speech you may not be able to interpret speech but other frequencies such as the beat of a drum in music which is why i guess you're saying my child was dancing and you're saying well he must be now hear the music to dance well yes you may well be able to hear some frequencies but not others so just because you have deafness to some frequencies means that you are not able to hear the other it doesn't mean you you can't hear other sounds and so it may well be that those sorts of sounds can be heard and can be responded to um, i'm very pleased that you've managed to find this because what you now need to do is make sure that you get appropriate help especially while young not you, the child, obviously, um, to make sure that the right interventions can be put in place to get the hearing as good as it can be so speech can develop normally and other language skills. Because this is the critical period of, of, of a young child growing up when their brain is really able to accommodate things and, and learn as rapidly as they're ever going to. And so there is this golden opportunity now. Now you've got to the nub of the problem to intervene meaningfully. Thank you so much, Tebi, and I'm so, so glad that you at least have some direction and there'll be a plan in place. Let's go through to Sandra. Sandra, hi. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Sandra. Hi, hi. Uh, Dr. Chris, I'd like to ask you, um, I've got a postnatal drip, and every time I eat, it gets so much worse that I feel like I've got to keep trying to clear my throat. And then eventually it settles a little bit. Why is, it, why is it when I only eat? Mm. Ah, well, what you might have, Sandra, and obviously I'm speculating because I don't know you and I don't know your past medical history, but some people do have some kind of allergies and certain things in food can trigger an oral allergy syndrome and they can elicit an allergic response. You might find when you eat certain things, if you're, say, allergic to certain plants, when you breathe them in, the pollen produces a runny nose. Sometimes eating things made by plants in the same family or same family group or, or group of plants can, can elicit the same reaction. So it might be that something in the food is making you have that reaction and making your nose runnier the other possibility is that just as when you, uh, if you think about Pavlov ringing the dinner bell and the dogs all salivated, when we know our dinner's coming, we tend to make more saliva. And it might be that when you know you're hungry and you're going to eat, because this triggers the production of saliva and maybe also mucus in the nose, it might be that the same pathways, because they're involved in both, are being triggered by the eating and drinking. And this is making your nose produce a few more secretions. And this is making the other symptom a bit more noticeable. So I think either way, it's worth getting the postnasal drip investigated, try to find out what's making it worse. And if it is allergy driven, and if it is, then simple remedies to start with, like antihistamines or like a nasal spray, might help to knock it on the head. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that question. Let's go to Glenn in Johannesburg CBD. Hi, Glenn. Hi, how are you, man? Good, thanks, and you? Good. I've got a question for the doctor. Yes, go ahead. My question is that, you know, this big truck uh, in the mine, I think it's 25 meters, the, the wheel normally is 25 meters high, and then you have this small tire uh, car, maybe a Picanto, which is very, very small. If they're both traveling one kilometer at, a, at, at the same speed, when they reach after one kilometer, will the same car have traveled the same kilometers or you find the other one have traveled less? 
wait, so did you say same speed of big wheels and small wheels? Basically, yes. okay, yes. okay. The big, big, you know, in, in the in the mind, there's that big, big wheel, twenty five meters high. Uh, I, the, the one that almost is as big as the ATOS. I got you. I got you, <laughs> doctor. Uh, well, I think if I understand the question correctly, if we're comparing, let's let's simplify this. If we're comparing a vehicle with massive wheels and a vehicle with small wheels, and they're both travelling at the same speed. So if I measure the front of the car going along, yes. have, have both wheels travelled the same distance? Well, the answer is no, they haven't. Because the wheel, the circumference of the wheel is the distance all the way around the outside. So you divide the distance the cars have travelled by the circumference of the wheel to find out how many times the wheels have gone round. And a wheel will complete fewer revolutions if the wheel circumference is bigger because it's got more wheel circumference to cover the distance than a smaller wheel. If the wheels are um, just, if you're just measuring the speed of a wheel and you had a wheel doing revolutions per minute, then obviously a bigger wheel is travelling farther than a smaller wheel because it has a bigger circumference. So it will it will describe a bigger movement overall than a small wheel. So it really comes down to what we're measuring. Are we measuring the speed of the car, the vehicle, whatever, and who's going over the line first? Or are we measuring how many times the wheel goes round? Because they actually are describing two quite different distances. And the bigger wheel, if it goes round the same number of times as the smaller wheel, has actually travelled farther. Yes, and I, th- I, th- I think you've uh, summed it up nicely because um, uh, obviously when you're speaking about the circumference, that actually speaks to the distance travel. Dr. Chris Smith, as always, a pleasure to have you on our show. We will be back together next Monday. And thank you to all of you for joining us today for 702 Afternoons.